from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Amarachi Ubani. Tonight, Osage Zayamu wins primary election tickets to emerge governorship candidates of the ruling All Progressives Congress ahead of the September governorship election in Edo State. Crisis rocking ruling APC continues as factional acting national chairman Victor Gerdom writes INEC asking the electoral umpire to disregard today's governorship primary in Edo State. Leading People's Democratic Party candidates in Edo State steps down for Governor Godin Obaseki ahead of Edo PDP governorship primary. People's Democratic Party national chairman says party will not impose any governorship candidates in Edo in Ondo State as he receives incumbent deputy governor who just dumped the APC. And Brazil becomes the second country after the U.S. with COVID-19 death toll surpassing 50,000. Plus, business, news from Abuja, the FCT, and later from our studios in London. On business news tonight, more support for Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala as ECOWAS backs her nomination for WTO top job. In sports news tonight, clubs vote to end 2019-20 Nigeria Professional Football League season due to coronavirus pandemic. And from Abuja, Southern leaders sue President Muhammad Buhari for 50 billion naira over what they describe as lopsided appointments and marginalization of the Southern region. Pastor Osage Izeyamu has been declared winner of the All Progressives Congress, the APC governorship primary. He polled 27,838 votes ahead of Pio Sudubu, who had 3,776 votes, and Osaro Baze with 2,724 votes. And now to the results in Benin City, the Edo State Capital, Chairman of the Election Committee and Governor of Imo State, Hope Uzodimma, commended the party official for a well-organized exercise. Number 10, Esaka West local government area up north down to the capital city in what 7 or the local government area. The All Progressives Congress APC carry out its governorship primary across the 192 wards of Edo State. Uh, one after the other, please don't rush, don't go close to anybody. The delegates make their choice from three aspirants, Osage Ze Yamun, Pius Odubu, and Osaro Obaze, following the COVID-19 preventive measures put in place, including wearing face masks and observing social distancing. 11, 12, 13, 14, social distance. From the earliest figures announced, Osage Ze Yamun is the man to beat. Pastor Osage Ze Yamun, 143 votes. Honorable Osaro Obaze, 20 votes. Dr. Pius Odubu, 40 votes. Hey! This is eventually confirmed from the final results. The chairman of the Edo APC Governorship Primary Committee, Senator Hope Uzodimma, declared the winner. From the reports and the calculation here, Pastor Osage Ezeyamu, who scored a total vote of 27,000, 838 votes has the highest number of votes cast in the election and is hereby returned a candidate of APC for the forthcoming governorship election in the election. The APC flag bearer in the September 19 governorship election in Edo State, Pastor Saige Ize Yamun, says the time has come to resolve the crisis in the party. Yeah. Every problem has an expiry date. And in my own humble opinion, the day we complete our primaries, that day the problem will end. So I believe that by this process, which we have just completed, 
the process, the party is now on the path of full recovery. Mr. Saro Obazi, an aspirant in a just concluded post, says the contest was a fair one. I'd like to appreciate the party for the transparency displayed during this contest. It was keenly contested and uh, to the extent that all my agents across the 18 local government you know, called me and told me that the exercise was transparent. With the primary election over, the APC in Edo State believes the next step is to put an end to the lingering issues in the party ahead of the governorship election. Despite the APC holding its Edo State governorship primary, the matter will still be heard by a federal high court sitting in Benin City, the state capital, on the adjourned date of July 6, 2020. It is the date set by the court to hear applications and the main suit filed by APC members Kenneth Asekome and Matthew Idurie seeking to stop the party from going ahead with the direct primary method. The defendants are the APC, Mr. Adams Oshomole, the Independent National Electoral Commission, and Inspector General of Police. Another day for proceedings in the suit regarding the mode of Edo governorship election primary for the All Progressives Congress APC, Kenneth Asekome and Matthew Idwaikeme instituted against the APC, Adam Sushomale, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and the Inspector General of Police, IGP. While the plaintiff's counsel seeks that the court hears applications and the main suit, an order the court had earlier made and subsequently affirmed by the Court of Appeal, the counsel to the second defendant informs the court he had appeals the appellate court striking out of his appeal. He tenders a notice of appeal, informing the court as well of his stay of proceedings application already filed. My appeal was struck out at the Court of Appeal because they said I appealed in respect of the substantive matter. And I said I was dissatisfied with that uh, uh, judgment because what I appealed upon was on issue of jurisdiction. Basically, on issue of jurisdiction, which is in relation to the internal or domestic affairs of a political party. The first defendant's counsel asks for time to react to the latest application, just as the plaintiff's counsel points out the importance of hearing the substantive suit simultaneously. For the first respondent, which I respect, the, 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 the motion paper was served on him this morning, just this morning. So we ask for time to react. The law permits us to do that. Our view was that that application, in line with the direction of the Court of Appeal, should be taken along with the main case. But we could not agree. So the court has now fixed because all the parties were served today. Some say they want to file processes against in reaction to the application. The council also touched on the petition the judge had received. The court brought to our attention that somebody on uh, Osaro Baze, who is not a party in this case, had written a petition against the judge to his chief judge, alleging bias. So the question is, a non-party to write a petition, that is also another strange happening. The court is adjourned until the 6th of July 2020 for hearing of the applications and the main suit. Jessica Oluguse, Channels Television News. So on the APC governorship primary in Edo State, the factional acting national chairman of the party, Mr. Victor Gerdom, has written to INEC saying the exercise was not approved by him. And the letter, dated June 18th and received by the electoral umpire today, Mr. Gerdom notes that the exercise which took place today had been postponed. He asked INEC not to monitor the exercise or provide support for the committee conducting the primary election in Edo State. Mr. Gadom said a new date for the primary would be communicated to the commission. And the crisis rocking the ruling All Progressives Congress continues to deepen as a factional acting chairman of the party. Mr. Hilad Etta inaugurated a new deputy national secretary. At a brief ceremony in Abuja, Mr. Etta said the swearing-in of Mr. Wogu Bombs is as a result of the vacancy in the office of the Deputy National Secretary. He explains that Mr. Victor Gadom, who is parading himself as the acting national chairman, is no longer a member of the party's National Working Committee, having resigned to contest the River State governorship election in 2019. We have
have a very short ceremony to perform. Uh, that is to swear in the our new Deputy National Secretary, uh, Barrister Wogu Bombs, from River State. Um, there's, um, there's not much to say apart from um, um, telling you uh, that we cannot have a vacuum at that level of administ party administration. We need immediately to fill that vacancy so that the National Secretary can be assisted in the oral responsibility and task of running the party from day to day. Staying with the crisis and the ruling party, some members from different states today staged a peaceful protest at the AP Secretariat against the members of the party's National Working Committee, demanding the resignation of the members. Led by a governorship aspirant from Benue State, Komod Okpoku Ogain, the protesters also called on the president, the National Nigerian Governors Forum, and party leaders in the National Assembly to take appropriate action to prevent the APC from collapsing. The aims and objectives of the party is being bastardized. The legacy of President Muhammadu Buhari is being destroyed. His hard-earned reputation is being dragged by the incessant activities of the National Working Committee of our party. This present National Working Committee has caused us to lose several states to the opposition. APC had 24 governors before the present National Working Committee came to power. Today, we have 18 governors. Just yesterday, the deputy governor of Ondo State had just left us and joined the opposition People's Democratic Party. Are we making progress or we are going backward? As a party, we must do away with the present National Working Committee before it kills the party completely. And the time is now. Let's turn to Kogi State now, where the governor, Yahya Bello, has another take on the crisis in the ruling APC, describing the exit of Edo State's governor, Godwin Obaseki, from the party as painful. But he believes the party will outlive its present challenges and expand its coast in upcoming elections. Governor Bello was speaking to State House correspondents after a delegation of North Central governors visited the chief of staff to the president. The governor, who heads a committee to set up uh, to look into security in the North Central, says he's liaising with security agencies to keep the region safe. I can assure you that our party is strong under the leadership of President Muhammad Buhari. And as a father, he is already looking into it. And I can assure you, we're going to come out very strong. We're going to go to Edo State, and we shall win Edo State election overwhelmingly for APC. We're going to go to Ondo State and win it overwhelmingly for APC. We will take a number of states and record it as a second APC uh, state in the, from the southeast and integrate our Igbo brothers into the, the fold. And we're going to take Ekiti once again and Oshun. So we're going to continue to expand our coast. So APC is strong. We're not divided. We're only seeing one same point from different angle. And we're trying to make ourselves understand you know, the, the points. That's just it. So there's no misunderstanding. APC is going to win Edo State. But unfortunately, uh, unfortunately I really felt the, the living of uh, our colleague, my colleague, His Excellency Governor Baseki, you know, leaving our party in whatever circumstance to another political party is painful anyway. But as a political party, we're going to take it back. In part two, after the break, a presidential task force on COVID-19 again expresses concern over massive disregard for ease of lockdown health protocols. Join us again. Welcome back. If it is joining us to watching the news at 10 live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. 
Osage Zayamu wins the primary election ticket to emerge governorship candidates of the ruling All Progressives Congress ahead of the September governorship election in Edo State. Crisis rocking the ruling APC continues as factional acting national chairman Victor Gadom writes INEC asking the electoral umpire to disregard today's governorship primary in Edo State. Leading People's Democratic Party candidates in Edo State steps down for Governor Gobi Nobaseki ahead of Edo PDP governorship primary. And People's Democratic Party national chairman says the party will not impose any governorship candidates in Ondo State as he receives incumbent deputy governor who just dubbed the APC. And Brazil becomes uh, the second country after the U.S. with COVID-19 death toll surpassing 50,000. Our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch channels, televisions, live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser. Or download the Channel TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV and Roku. In a bit to address the crisis rocking the APC, governors of Plateau, Jigawa and Kebi State have met and concluded their closed-door meeting with President Muhammadu Buhari, briefing State House correspondents after the meeting. The Kebi State Governor and Chairman of the Progressive Governors Forum, Atiku Baguru, says the court cases and dissenting voices in the party is a testament to the true democratic nature of the APC. He also says President Buhari is committed to ensuring that all party issues are resolved soon and he's taking steps towards that. The reason for our visit is to discuss with him as our party leader, as the leader that millions of Nigerians trust to discuss party issues and the position of the progressive governors to support all steps to unify and bring about peaceful resolution in, the, in our party, the All Progressive Congress. Young people expressing their view by demonstrating uh, members of the party challenging in court processes show that people are free to express their view and uh, dissent is not suppressed. What is important is that all will be taken on board in arriving at a conclusion that will be to the satisfaction of most party members and indeed Nigerians. We and now to the opposition and aspirants in the forthcoming People's Democratic Party governorship primary election. Mr. Gideon Ikine has stepped down, declaring support for the Edo State Governor, Mr. Godwin Obaseki. Mr. Ikine, who declared his support for the governor at his campaign office in Benin City, noted that his decision was to allow the governor consolidate on his developmental strides. Mr. Obaseki, on his part, restated his commitment to making the people's welfare his priority. Every delegate that have worked with us across the state, you have to redouble your effort to ensure that the margin of victory between us and the next opponent at the primary will be nothing less than 600 votes. Getting the tickets is nothing compared to getting the victory in the election. We are going to work with you, sir, and by the grace of God, the glory of PDP will continue to be on the rise. In coming into PDP, I want to play the role in the Gideon has played today. <laughs> one of ensuring that there is unity in the party. One of ensuring that we should expand the umbrella so that it can cover many more people. One of appreciating that people have worked over the last decades to build this party. 
And therefore, everybody must have a space within this party. It had to be about the people, not about a few individuals in this country. It has to be about translating a new vision and new values, the ones we, you grow up with. When you say white is white, white is white. You cannot say because you're in politics, white now becomes black. In Ondo State, the Deputy Governor, Mr. Agbola Ajayi, who earlier resigned from the APC, has officially been received into the PDP by the party's national leaders. At the reception ceremony held at the party's secretariat in Akure, the national chairman, Mr. Uchi Sekondos, described Mr. Ajayi's return as an act of God. The inscriptions on this billboard says it all. The Deputy Governor of Ondo State, Mr. Agwala Ajayi, is leaving the All Progressives Congress, APC, to team up with the opposition, People's Democratic Party, the PDP. <laughs> Members of the National Working Committee of the PDP, some leaders of the party in the state, as well as the Southwest, all converge on the state secretariat of the party in Akure, where Mr. Ajayi was received into the party by the national chairman of the PDP, Mr. Uche Secondus. In his address at the event, Mr. Secondus says the deputy governor's defection to the PDP is divinely inspired. The PDP is a mass movement. A new mass movement that is coming like an avalanche upon this country. And I believe that God is behind it. Your defection from APC to PDP is an act of God. We welcome you to your party today. You are welcome, Your Excellency, to PDP. Mr. Jai expresses delight to be back to the PDP, but he insists that he still remains the deputy governor of Ondo State. I was totally detained by the commissioner of police of Ondo State. The freedom of fundamental human rights and my immunity that is granted by the Nigerian constitution. It was highly embarrassed to Nigerians and to the entire police force. But no problem. We, we, we are there. With his defection, the people of the state are now waiting for the next move of the deputy governor as political activities towards the October governorship election unfolds. From politics to security, Northwest governors are appealing to residents of the state to stop providing intelligence to bandits that are behind the rising insecurity in the region. Addressing journalists after a meeting with the National Security Advisor in Abuja, the governors of Katsina and Sokoto say the people's cooperation and efforts by the security agencies will nip the problem in the bud. Nigeria's northwest region is experiencing insecurity arising from banditry and kidnapping. According to the International Crisis Group, the violence has led to the death of over 8,000 people since 2011 and displaced over 200,000 persons. Governors from the region and Niger State are here for a meeting with the National Security Advisor, and the meeting which was held behind closed doors appears to be fruitful. Basically, we want to reassure the wider Nigerian society of the commitment of the security agencies to work closely with the political leadership of the states affected by this um, criminality. One of the issues which came up at the meeting is a need to involve the people in the fight to stop banditry. We discovered that a lot of uh, uh, people have become informant to the bandits. That uh, gave them information about the movement of armed forces and security agencies. So if which, uh, the people must cooperate and stop patronizing the bandits by way of giving them information. 
all information that uh, will help in carving out uh, uh, this uh, banditry should be given to uh, law enforcement agents, not to the criminals. I will continue to appeal to citizens to continue to collaborate and cooperate with the security agencies in terms of giving credible uh, intelligence that will help and facilitate their work and showing more understanding with the, with, the, with the security agencies and the government because this is not a normal conventional warfare. The United Nations Agency for Refugees says the situation has forced an estimated 23,000 people to seek refuge in Niger Republic in April 2020, making the total number of refugees from that part of Nigeria to rise to more than 60,000 since the first influx in April 2019. Meanwhile, the Borno state government is asking the federal government to draft local hunters and civilian joint task force members into the Nigerian army. Governor Babagana Zulum made this call during a visit by a delegation of the National Assembly led by Senate leader Yahya Abdullahi. He says the only solution to the insecurity is to smoke out the insurgents and dislodge them from their hideouts around the Lake Chad shores and Sambisa forest. The Senate leader on his part assured the governor that the National Assembly will support the executive in terms of passage of supplementary budgets for funding of security. We are currently operating in the shores of the Lake Chad as well as in the Sambisa game reserve. The only solution to ending this insurgency is to ensure that the insurgents are displaced in their hideouts, are dislodging their hideouts. Another most important thing is the collaboration between the government of Borno State and our neighboring countries. I don't think it is feasible for the government of Borno State for the government of Nigeria to succeed without the collaboration of our neighboring countries. The support of the Chadian administration, the support of the Cameroon administration and that of Niger administration is needed to end this insurgency. On the phone, let's do the executive arm of government that anything, any effort, no stone will be left at hand. No amount of resources will be spared. If it is budgeted or a certain project can be prepared and be submitted to the National Assembly, we will make sure that we will leave no stone at hand to make sure that we support the executive arm and provide the administration with all the necessary resources that are required to support our security agencies this nation and rid our people of insurgents and bandits. When the news of 10 returns, more support for Ngozi Okonjo Wiala as ECOWAS backs Nigeria's nomination for World Trade Organization Director General. That's on Business News. Join us again. Welcome back to the news of 10. I'm going to toss it over now to Linda Akigbe in Abuja for more. Hi, Linda. Hello, Amaraki. Welcome to Abuja. Uh, hello, Amaraki, once again, and welcome to Abuja. The Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 has again expressed concerns about, about what it calls massive disregard for the ease of lockdown health protocols, insisting on a need for a behavioral change to flatten the COVID-19 curve. At a daily news conference in Abuja, both the Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and the National Coordinator of the PTF maintained that the risk of contracting the virus is higher at this time. And On Thursday, June the 18th, Nigeria recorded 745 new cases of COVID-19, the highest number of daily diagnoses of the virus since its outbreak in the country in February this year. Although the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 has repeatedly attributed a daily discovery of new cases to the ramp-up of testing across the country, members are concerned about the massive disregard for the safety protocols as more persons test positive for the virus. 
uh, some of the observations that have arisen from these activities include the fact that Nigerians have continued to show persistent and remarkable lack of compliance to COVID-19 uh, prevention protocols, which is quite worrying, really. In the cities where adherence to these protocols were high in the initial two weeks of the ease lockdown, progressively over time, citizens are letting down their guards, and this remains of um, grave concern. I must say the one area that worried us the most as we traveled around the country is that we still struggle to see sufficient people wearing masks. We still saw gatherings of too many people in the place at the time. And we know that across the country, we're struggling with this. And I really want to encourage all Nigerians. We can't treat our way out of this. We simply can't. We have to prevent. It's the only chance we have. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation re-emphasizes the need for personal responsibility. In Africa, the World Health Organization has reported that South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria and Ghana have proportionately been the most affected countries on the continent of Africa. We really have a choice to make and there is an urgency of yesterday in our choice. There are currently over 20,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria from the over 113 samples tested so far, while over 6,800 cases have been treated and discharged from the hospitals. The number of fatalities have also risen to over 500. The Minister of Health says some of these deaths could have been prevented. The experience we are making suggests that some of the fatalities recorded in our country may possibly have been saved if they had arrived designated treatment centers early enough. While the daily increase in the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 and associated deaths should be a source of worry for the government, it should also be a wake-up call for citizens to take responsibility and protect one another from the virus. Cut. You see they take... Elder statesmen and leaders of social cultural organizations in the southern region have slammed a 50 billion naira suit on President Buhari at the Federal High Court Abuja over alleged marginalization and upsided appointments. In a suit filed on their behalf by Mr. Michael Zekome, the group led by Chief Edwin Clark and 15 other elders alleged that since inception of this administration in 2015, President Buhari's appointments contravened the provisions of the 1999 Constitution and the Federal Character Principle. Elder Justice Men, all Nigerians, like Chief Ike Clark, Chief Ayo Adebanjo, Chief Nyangudo, Alawo Broderick Bozimo, Chief Pogu, Brokno Akere, and some other chief Chukwe Maker, Ezife, and others representing the various ethnic nationalities that are dissatisfied with the way and manner the country is being run, have come to court with certain prayers, including claiming 50 billion naira damages against the president, the attorney general of the federation, the federal character commission and others for the severe breaches of the provisions of section 14, 15, 16, 17, 153, 216, 217, 218, of the 1999 Constitution. 
The federal government has met with the charge d'affaire of the High Commission of Ghana to Nigeria, Ms. Eva Denu, after summoning her to demand an explanation on the recent attack on the residential building in the diplomatic premises of Nigeria in Ghana. Armed men reportedly stormed the High Commission in the early hours of Saturday and demolished the newly constructed building meant to serve as residence for staff and visiting diplomats. Ghana's Foreign Affairs Ministry says it has initiated investigations into the incident. Meanwhile, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Onyema, says the Ghanaian government has apologized to Nigeria and promised to bring those behind the invasion to book. According to him, the attack was allegedly carried out by a group of people claiming ownership of the land where the Nigeria High Commission is cited. What we can say is that um, it was a non-state actor that was involved. I mean, it was not the government, and it was not government-sanctioned. Uh, we've engaged with the highest level of uh, authority in Ghana. It appears that uh, there are some people who are claiming uh, that they have uh, legitimate a title uh, over that piece of land. And um, the message um, I received directly from the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Ghana was that um, everything will be sorted out, that will be settled, that um, the President had um, directed uh, for a very severe action to be taken. Uh, against uh, those who were responsible for that, um, you know, including if immediate arrest, and um, that they will be coming out with uh, uh, a definitive statement. So we have to wait. And that's all from Abuja. Now to Anne Wawodu for Business News. Thank you, Linda, and welcome to Business News. The Economic Community of West African States has endorsed Nigeria's former finance minister, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, for the position of Director General of the World Trade Organization. In a document, ECOWAS expressed its support and calling on other African and non African countries to support Dr. Okonjo Iwela due to her fearless reforms during her tenure as minister and managing director of the World Bank. Dr. Kunjo Iwela was nominated by President Muhammadu Buhari in June for the WTO top job, but has faced opposition from Egypt and the African Union. WTO had confirmed her eligibility to run for the office of the Director General over the weekend. Meanwhile, Dr. Kunjo Iwela in a tweet has thanked ECOWAS for supporting her candidacy as WTO Director General. Oil workers under the ages of the Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association of Nigeria and National Union of Petroleum and Natural Gas Workers have issued a three-day warning strike to protest the enrollment of oil workers into the integrated payroll and personal information system. The bodies, in a joint letter to the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Mr. Timipre Silva, expressed that the strike will commence on Wednesday, June the 24th, and it will last till Friday, June the 26th. That letter also adds that the move is in line with the withholding of May salaries of some of its members working in federal government agencies over alleged non-compliance with the federal government's directive that all its agencies should enroll on the IPPIS payment platform. Let's head to the stock market where gains in the consumer goods sector was not enough to see off the red alert starting this week at the equities market. The all share index dipped due to the sell off in shares of some bellwether stocks. But let's join Chimezie Obiwago for the details. Thank you and welcome to the stock market report. The equities market is not smiling at all. The hope that the bulls will make a comeback today was dashed as anxiety over a possible second wave of COVID-19 infections 
knocked off investors' confidence. What we saw was no different from what played out in the global market. And more importantly, the local boss is not strong enough to withstand any shock from the high cap stocks. So even the gains we saw in Leslie could not move the index even though it succeeded in pushing up the consumer goods by as much as 2.10%. Market breadth is still very negative, with Nigerian breweries, Stambic IBTC, Boa Cement, and Flour Mill heavily battered. And so the All Share Index again landed in the red, down 0.29%. Liquidity was nothing to write home about. Look at the activity chart. Volume and value are particularly very low, and this is very much unlike this market. Investors' apathy to equities lately is also not far from the expectations of the second quarter results, which investors fear may not be satisfactory. In whatever form the market turns out this week, traders can only hope for the best. And that was the Stock Market Report. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. That's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Amarachi. I'm Anne Mwawudu. Thanks a lot, Anne. And still ahead on the news at 10, Brazil becomes the second country after the U.S. with COVID-19 death toll surpassing 50,000. Plus, more stories from our London studio and around the world in five. Stay with us. Welcome back. More than 50,000 people have died from the coronavirus in Brazil, making it the second country after the U.S. to register such high numbers. It comes amid growing political tension in just days after the country confirmed more than one million coronavirus infections. Here's Simon Pusey with more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Supporters of Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro have taken to the streets of Sao Paulo to call for an end to coronavirus restrictions, even as Brazil passes 50,000 coronavirus deaths. Demonstrators draped in Brazilian flags gathered in one of Sao Paulo's main avenues to show support for Bolsonaro, who has criticized social distancing during the pandemic, saying that it is a more dangerous measure than the virus itself. Brazil has reported the second highest number of COVID-19 deaths in the world, behind only the United States. Meanwhile, South Korea has announced that it is going through a second wave of coronavirus after a national holiday weekend in May. The outbreak has mainly occurred in the greater Seoul area, which had previously seen very few cases. In the Chinese capital Beijing, an inflatable testing laboratory has been set up to increase the city's coronavirus testing capacity after authorities reported 18 newly confirmed cases on Sunday. With its modular layout, the laboratory can be easily set up and disassembled anywhere there's a need. Meanwhile, Europe has gradually emerged from lockdown with Spain reopening its borders and lifting its state of emergency, while France celebrated its annual music festival and reopened its cinemas. The United States and Russia have begun talks on their major nuclear weapons agreement in Vienna amid growing tensions over whether they see any value in arms control at all. U.S. President Donald Trump has insisted that China should be involved in the talks on the new strategic arms reduction treaty that caps U.S. and Russian nuclear warheads. China has shown no signs of any interest in joining. The new START treaty, which was agreed in 2010, expires in February 2021, leaving little time to renew a complex deal or to negotiate a new treaty involving China. In the UK, tributes to three victims who were stabbed in Reading have been paid as the town comes to terms with what happened on Saturday evening when an attacker randomly stabbed people in a park. A minute's silence was held in Reading on Monday morning. More than 100 students gathered to hold a silence at the school where the first identified victim, James Furlong, worked as a teacher. A second victim named by their family in the US has been identified as Joe Ritchie Bennett. A 25-year-old Libyan national is in custody on suspicion of murder and Home Secretary Priti Patel has said he was acting alone. A New York police officer has been suspended after an apparent chokehold incident was caught on video. Stop choking him! This video shows many officers restraining the man on his stomach, while one officer wraps his arms around the man's neck. The New York Police Department banned the use of chokeholds in 1993. 
the death of George Floyd after a police officer knelt on his neck while detaining him in Minneapolis on May the 25th has put police tactics and methods under the spotlight once again. Australia's High Court has said that a former judge sexually harassed six female members of staff. Dyson Hayden is one of Australia's most powerful figures to face such accusations amid a global reset in workplace gender relations. The court's statement did not give details of the incidents under scrutiny, but said it was told of allegations of sexual harassment against a former justice in 2019 and immediately ordered an independent investigation. Over 200 migrants rescued from sinking boats in the Mediterranean by the German NGO Sea-Watch 3 have arrived at a Sicilian port for medical checks before a precautionary quarantine. Of the 211 people on board, mainly from Africa, 20 are women and 62 are minors, including a few months old baby. For years, Italy was the primary route into Europe for hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers and other irregular migrants. But after a crackdown in Libya against smugglers and port closures due to coronavirus, the numbers of people attempting to cross the Mediterranean have fallen sharply. Minibus taxi drivers in South Africa have organized a strike to demand more financial support from the government. Since the coronavirus shutdown began, taxis have been operating at only 70% capacity under strict social distancing rules, which has caused thin margins in an industry dependent on maximum passenger loads at low fares. Dozens of taxis blocked busy roads in Johannesburg and Pretoria, confronting police and leaving hundreds unable to make it to work. And finally, after months of taking classes online due to lockdown restrictions, some yoga enthusiasts in the Canadian city of Toronto have begun practicing their poses in individual clear geodesic domes. The event was launched on the International Day of Yoga and will last almost a month. The 50 domes have built-in heating regulation to create a similar atmosphere as a hot yoga studio. They are also cleaned and disinfected after every use to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. 17 chairmen of the Nigeria Professional Football League clubs have voted that the 2019-2020 season should come to an end with the top three clubs representing Nigeria at the CAF Interclubs competition in the next season. Only Rangers International of Enugu voted for the Super 6 option for the winners to emerge, as well as the three clubs to represent the country in next season's continental campaign. Meanwhile, Nigeria Football Federation is urging football stakeholders to wait until after the ongoing consultations to know the format and pattern of foreclosing the 2019-20 football season. Today, a vast majority of club owners in the Nigeria Professional Football League had voted to end the season. Jose Mourinho launched an impassioned defense of Harry Kane's form under his playing style at Tottenham Hotspur after television pundit Paul Merson suggested the England striker would struggle in the Portuguese manager's system. Merson feels Kane could consider switching clubs if Mourinho continued adopting a conservative style in the Premier League like he did in their one-all draw with Manchester United last week. FC Barcelona manager Kike Setien believes the video assistant referee system is not being implemented with consistency in La Liga in the wake of Real Madrid's controversial win at Real Sociedad over the weekend. Madrid beat Sociedad 2-1 to climb above Barca and top La Liga. And that's sports news. And the main news again. Osage Zayamu emerged as the governorship candidate of the ruling All Progressives Congress today, ahead of the September governorship election in Edo State. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Good night.